Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Power of Population Data Science webinar series. My name is Anne Greenwood, and I'm the Education and Training Lead for Population Data BC, and it's my pleasure to introduce Karen Tinge, who will be presenting on Record Linkage to Enhance Consented Cohort and Routinely Collected Health Data from a UK Birth Cohort. By way of introduction, Karen Tinge is Principal Statistical Methodologist at the UK's Office for National Statistics. Prior to this, she was a statistician for the Administrative Data Research Centre in Wales and co-director of the BIP Insight research team at Swansea University, conducting operational research on academic publications. Her current role with the Ontario National Statistics involves leading a team to explore the application of data science techniques on national social survey methodology. The team develops research in natural language processing, data linkage, and machine learning as tools to improve data collection and processing for large-scale social surveys. Karen is also on a PhD, working on a PhD in public health at Swansea University, supervised by Dr. Charles Musselwhite. Her project uses anonymized linked administrative data to create a longitudinal model on households and communal establishments in Wales. So thank you, Karen, for presenting today. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and I'll hand the presentation over to you, Karen. Thanks very much. Um, hello, everyone. I'm finding it slightly disconcerting because I can't see anyone, but that's probably a good thing. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a project that I led for a few years uh, while working at Swansea University. Um, just to clarify, I am currently working at the Office for National Statistics in the UK. This project is not part of that work. This project um, was a, a collaboration that I'll talk about later later on in the presentation. So I'll just give a sort of very brief overview of the project aim and background. I'll talk quite a bit about the data, some about the linkage, quite a lot about the harmonization, and then talk about some of the lessons that we've learned. Um, so the main aim was to link um, a UK, UK longitudinal birth cohort to routine health data in order to answer some questions about common childhood problems. So it was a partly a methodological issue of what sort of linkage rates are we going to get and partly a uh, sort of epidemiological um, project. So this was a Wellcome Trust grant uh, that ran for three years and was led by uh, the PIs were Professors Ronan Lyons from Swansea University and Carol Desito, who at the time was at uh, the Institute for Child Health at UCL and is now at Queen Mary's in London. Uh, it was a collaboration between Swansea University, where Professor Lyons was, and two colleges within University College London, the Institute for Child Health, where Carol Desito was, and the Centre for Longitudinal Studies, led by Emla Fitzsimmons, uh, where we got the Millennium Cohort Study data. So the reason why we wanted to do this study was because longitudinal surveys provide a lot of the why did something happen type data. So um, a good an example that I often give is the electronic patient record data that we've got here in Wales can tell you how many people, how many children received an M MMR vaccination on time but doesn't necessarily tell you why they might not have received it. Whereas the, the surveys often ask more subjective, emotive questions like that. So we can get quite detailed data from both surveys and routine data. By the way, when I talk about routine data, I've also heard it called admin data or administrative data. It means data that is collected for it a primary purpose, not for research. Um, so that can be electronic patient records, it can be um, benefits data, taxation data, anything like that. Um, so we wanted to see what sort of, whether we could answer quite detailed epidemiological questions by linking surveys and um, routine data. So the survey that we used was the Millennium Cohort Study, based in the UK. It's a longitudinal birth cohort. It's got 
started off with approximately 19,000 children born in the UK between 2000 and September 2001. Um, it covers the whole of the UK, but it is oversampled for deprived areas and ethnic minorities. Um, it has has quite a few sweeps. So data was collected initially at nine months of age and then 3, 5, 7, 11, 14, and 17 years. And I believe they might be planning the 18 or 19 year one. They may have already had the 18 year one. At the at age, when the children were age seven, so this is sweep four, the parents were asked to consent to link to the child's health and education data. Um, there was approximately, I think, a 96% um, consent rate uh, for the whole of the UK. And we used that consent to then link to um, the routine data. So routine data we had, or we, we requested data from England, Wales, and Scotland. Um, and we received data from Wales and Scotland, but not from England. Uh, we, the data that we had was from birth up to the age of 14 years as per the consent forms. So the consent was can we link to your child's um, routine health records up to the age of 14? So for some children, that would have meant that the data ended in 2014. For others, it meant they, it ended in uh, 2015. So we've got data up to 2015, but in some instances, we can only get, we can only use data up to 2014. And I hope that makes sense. I'm happy to clarify later on if you need it. Uh, so the sort of data that we got um, was child health data, including birth records um, and immunisation data. We had emergency department data, hospital inpatient and primary care general practice data only for Wales. Uh, GP record data isn't widely available in the UK yet. Scotland doesn't have it. Northern Ireland doesn't have it. And we didn't. Um, request data from Northern Ireland anyway. Um, England has it for, I think, approximately 12% of the population. So it's still a sizable amount of the population, but it is only 12%. Uh, so in terms of the actual data timeline, and this explains some of the why we didn't get the English data, we managed to get the Millennium Cohort Study data and the Welsh routine data fairly quickly. Welsh data was pretty easy because we were using the Secure Anonymized Information Linkage Data Bank held at Swansea University. And that already has preloaded a lot of the Welsh health, routine health data. Um, so what you do is you apply for you apply for access to that data through an information governments panel. That normally takes about three months. In our instance, it took two months. And so immediately we had access to that data. Scotland, we didn't receive the data until June 2016. It was quite a long drawn out process, but the Scottish um, team, the Scottish ISD team were extremely helpful and I cannot recommend them highly enough. Um, so if you want Scottish data, I would say absolutely make use of the ISD team. England, we didn't manage to get it all. After two years, uh, the application was rejected because they didn't uh, agree with the wording of the consent form. Uh, we did appeal this on the grounds that the English NHS routine health data system wrote the consent forms but that didn't fly and we ended up not getting the data. Um, um, at that point, we only had, so it had taken two years to reach the point of getting rejected and we only had a year to appeal, get access to the data, clean the data, process it, analyze it, and then report on it. So in the end, we just gave up on England, which was a shame because that meant we lost out on about 10,000 records. Um, the linkage process wasn't done by us. Uh, in in uh, Swansea University, it's done by a trusted third party. Um, I'm sorry about the this particular slide. The arrows seem to have got mixed up when I moved it into um, up into Google Drive. So what happens for um, both systems? The data comes to a trusted third party. In both instances, it was the devolved um, National Health Service Informatics System. In Wales, that's 
NWIS, National Wales Informatics Service in Scotland, it's ISD. I think it's Information Services Division, Scotland. Wales uses a combination of uh, probabilistic and deterministic linkage um, based on the National Health Service number, which is in theory unique to each person, but in practice it's not accurate to about 2%. Um, they also use first name, um, surname, date of birth, full address and postcode. And from that, we get an ALF, an anonymized linkage field into sale. Um, the Welsh data and Scottish data also had a Millennium Cohort Study identifier attached to it. And in this way, we could use the MCS identifier to link to other MCS tables and the ALF to link to other routine health data. Um, again, I'm happy to go through this in more detail if anyone has any questions. Scotland uses a slightly different system. They, um, they base their linkage on first initial surname, date of birth, full address and postcode. But what we got back was just the Millennium Cohort Study identifier that, we, that was then linked, pre-linked to the routine health data. So the routine health data tables didn't have the personalised IDs, it had the Millennium Cohort Study identifier in place that we could then use to link to the other MCS tables. Um, in terms of the sample, uh, the total Millennium Cohort Study participants at Sweep 4 for the whole of the UK was a little over 14,000, but uh, about approximately 10,000 of those were excluded immediately because they were interviewed in England or Northern Ireland which left us with um, 1,965 in Wales and 1,623 in Scotland, including those that didn't give, give consent to link. Of those, there were only 252, which left us with a total number of 3,390. But for various methodological reasons, we only wanted singleton births. Uh, we wanted to exclude twins, triplets and firstborns of multiple births in order to guarantee that we were linking on the right children. So we ended up with um, a total of 3,269 children, so 1,838 in Wales and 1,431 in Scotland. Um, in terms of linkage per data set, most of the, the linkage was for the child health data set, which kind of makes sense because most children should be recorded on a child health data set. Scotland is slightly weird because Scotland records um, immunizations, whether they've been taken up or not. So for that reason, we excluded immunizations because we thought that would skew the linkage rates. So Scotland child health as a, um, as a whole was 100%, but excluding the immunizations, it's only 91%. Well, only 91%. Um, Wales was 99.6%. Some of these others, the emergency department, hospital inpatient, they're lower, but we kind of, it's kind of understandable because not everyone goes to, goes to an emergency department. Not everyone has a hospital inpatient episode. So, this doesn't necessarily represent a failure to link. It might just be that these, these kids never access that particular service. Uh, primary care general practice, sale holds data on, I think approximately 80% of Welsh GPs. So that may explain why the linkage rate for Wales was fairly low. Well, 83, 83.6%. Um, we did try to look at whether the sample, the linked samples were representative. Looking at the proportions compared to the um, overall Millennium Cohort Study sample, they're generally fairly representative. Um, things like Scotland had slightly more mothers who gave, gave birth age 40 or over. Um, but actually, what we found was that measuring representativeness for a dependent sample is actually very difficult. And this is something that I'm looking at with my own team at the Office for National Statistics at the moment. How do you accurately measure 
representativeness of a dependent sample where you may not have access to the full parent data and you're unable to extract the linked data. So in our case, we didn't have the full Millennium Cohort study data. We only had those where, we, where there was consent to link. Um, the, we got um, proportions of demographic data from the Millennium Cohort Study website, but we weren't able to extract those linked records to see whether our sample was representative of the unlinked sample uh, or the unconsented sample. There are quite a few categories per demographic, which excludes um, uh, statistics such as the McNamara test. So that's something that we're looking at at the moment. So once you've got the data, it's actually not as easy as just then putting it all together and running the uh, running your tests, because even within the UK, there are differences in the way the data is defined, the way the data is handled between the nations, um, the types of data that is collected. So you have to do a bit of harmonization before you can analyze the data. And this then might mean that you lose some, um, some detail. So in terms of what it actually is, these, these slides um, on harmonization, by the way, are from a colleague of mine from the project, Amrita. She put together the slides for uh, a previous conference presentation. So having this data from multiple sources can be potentially very useful because it, it allows you to, ex, to expand your sample size, which for our, for our case was extremely important because we did lose uh, the bulk of our population. Um, but you, you, you might have that, um, you might have to weigh up the loss of complexity. So the data sources that we had we had the Millennium Cohort Study data. Um, the MCS ID was called the Edgy Serial ID, which is why you see that there. So we had survey data, MCS survey data from Wales and Scotland. PEDU is the patient episode data set for Wales. That's a hospital episode, hospital inpatient episode data. Uh, EDDS is the emergency department data set. So we had Edgy Serials linking to these. Scotland SMR01 is the equivalent of PEDU. It's the hospital inpatient data. A&E version two is the equivalent of EDDS. It's the emergency department data. Um, so what we're able to do was then merge the, um, the PEDU and the SMR into a, hosp a, a hospital inpatient data set, merge EDDS and A&E into an A&E data set within limits. So the types of challenges that we had when we were looking at harmonizing the data were you might have a different name but a similar concept. So it might be week of birth versus date of birth, or one might be called admi uh, admission method, another might be called um, attendance method or something like that. You might have a similar name, but it's a different concept. So for example, a diagnosis for one might be all of the diagnoses that are then coded up in a specific way to indicate the priority, or for another, it might be main diagnosis and then all the other diagnoses. You might have a different coding system. For example, um, uh, you might have ICD-10 in one, read codes in another, or SNOMED codes in another. Uh, you might have different data structures where one is a numeric, one is text. There might be differences in data coverage. This specifically for the years that the uh, the data sets were running for, and there might be actually no equivalent variable between. Um, it might exist in one data set but not in another. So then, in order to harmonise the data, we defined the the research specific definition, and this is something that's quite interesting because. I'm hearing a lot, um, and I've seen a lot with big international collaborations where harmonization is done at a very, very high level. And so there is no scope for res 
specific uh, research definitions, which I think is a bit of a shame, um, especially when you are, I can understand why they do it, especially if you have a, data from multiple countries where there might be huge numbers of differences. Um, but I, I still think it's a, it's a bit of a shame. I think there should be the scope to allow for researchers to specify how they want um, harmonization to be done for their own project. Um, we recoded variables. We created standardized variable names just to aid us with our algorithms, um, common data structures. We cut some data sets down because they, they, there wasn't um, the same level of coverage. Um, and in some instances, we derived a research variable where one didn't exist. So in terms of the uh, different name similar concept, um, the concept of admission method. So in PEDU, in the Welsh data set, this is the method of admission to a hospital provider spell. And in Scotland, an inpatient admission is categorized as an emergency, urgent or routine inpatient admission, except for maternity and neonatal admissions. So very similar um, concepts. In Wales, this is called admiss method code. In Scotland, it's called ad admission type. You do, do have some quite different um, uh, values, definitions here, so the coding. Um, for example, well, you've got maternity admission in PEDU, which is included in other in Scotland. And in Wales, you have a separate other. So if you wanted to look at maternity admissions, you may struggle to do that if you are trying to compare PEDU, uh, PEDU and SMR, Wales and Scotland. Um, so what we ended up doing was for our own specific research needs, we created an admission category, which was emergency was one, other was zero. So it's just a binary code. Um, other examples were date of admission, date of discharge, and principal diagnosis and admission classification. Um, so similar name, but different concept. Um, what have we got here? So in ED EDDS, the diagnosis code, three-digit ICD-10 code, up to six diagnosis types. This is something that we, we did find and we kind of struggled with a little bit. Um, in Scotland, you only have up to three diagnoses, whereas for the, for the A&E data set, Wales, you've got six, Scotland, you've got three. Um, and the, the diagnosis codes were very different. Again, Wales used ICD-10. Scotland didn't uh, use two character codes, which were then um, we had a, a data dictionary. Um, they also, Scotland also helpfully had a disease code, which was again up to three, but this one was ICD-10, um, and they had a free text diagnosis text. What they didn't have was consistency across all three variables. So you might have diagnosis code and a diagnosis text, or you might have a disease code, but you might, you usually didn't have all three. Um, so we created one variable, which was the nature of injury. And Amrita did a fantastic job with this algorithm, um, mapping it all between the, between the various um, values, uh, variables, in order to create a consistent diagnosis code. And when you're, when you're looking at um, epidemiological uh, data for children, the diagnosis code, and especially the, um, the first diagnosis code, the primary diagnosis code, is very, very important. Uh, there is a, we're putting together an article at the moment on this work, which goes into more detail. Um, in terms of data structure between the two, PEDU, and it turns out England um, have this concept of spells, episodes, and then super spells. So an episode is kind of a transfer between departments in a hospital. A spell is one admission. Um, and then a super spell is where you might have um, an admission discharge. And then within, I think, 24 or 48 hours, the patient comes back for another admission. 
So that's called a super spell. Scotland only has the equivalent of the spell. Um, and Wales has up to 11 episodes. So Wales has up to 11 transfers between departments, which you don't get in Scotland. Wales also has up to 13 diagnosis codes for the hospital inpatient, whereas Scotland only has six. Um, OP is the operational codes. So these are the procedures. Again, Wales has 12, Scotland has seven. So it didn't happen a lot, but it did happen where you had children that had more than six diagnoses in Wales. And then it was a case of, OK, what do we do with these? Do we cut them down at six because we only have the equivalent in Scotland of six? Or do we add more for Scotland, even though we know that they don't have them? Um, so what we ended up doing was creating a super spell and episodes based on other data that we had within Scotland. Um, and then creating these additional episodes, diagnoses and operations, even though for Scotland, a lot of these would be missing. But at least it created a bit of harmony. We weren't losing data from Wales. We were just adding a lot of missing, well, not missing, but a lot of blank variables for Scotland. Um, in terms of derived research variables, this kind of comes down to what data you've got available. So for, for example, um, date of birth, in Wales, one of the um, one of the privacy pre preserving features is that you don't get actual date of birth. You have week of birth, which is a full date to the Monday closest to the actual date of birth. So it might be up to seven days uh, before the actual date of birth or seven days after the actual date of birth. But Scotland only had year and month of birth. So for things like um, uh, immunizations where having the the actual or as close as we could age was really really important so for immunizations you don't want to just go by how many months they were you want to go by how many days they were because that's that's a variable in your in your data um, so we created a random date of birth for both Wales and Scotland um, which generated an accuracy of plus or minus 30 days, but at least gave us a a date that was um, that we could use. So super spell or person spell we we created for Scotland, and then length of stay um, we didn't have in Pedu, we did have in Scotland. So we created a continuous hospital stay um, for for Wales. Uh, the data time period that we had, MCS was from 2000. It runs on, but we had it until um, 2014. EDDS in in Scot in Wales, we had um, actually these numbers are all wrong. Uh, we had from 2009, but A and E we had from 2007. So the uh, the Scottish data, we had more Scottish data than we did for for Wales, but we then couldn't use the Scottish data that we, uh, the additional two years, because we didn't have anything comparable in Wales. So we ended up truncating the uh, Scottish data by two years so that they both started in 2009 and ran until uh, 2015. Um, so in terms of the, the actual numbers that we ended up with, um, the total Welsh linked population was 1,838. For the merged hospital data set, we ended up with 1,334. And for the merged A&E data set, 1,142. Scotland, we did end up with quite a few less, um, but we, end, we had more admissions and attendances because one child might have multiple attendances. Uh, these are just some publications that we've come that we've produced from the project. They're a mix of the epidemiological work that we did around the um, the hospital inpatients, obesity, um, asthma, uh, injuries, 
immunizations. We've got a few that are still in progress. So Amrita's got one that's being reviewed at the moment um, on childhood and risk behavioral difficulties in childhood using the strengths and difficulties questionnaire and the risk of adolescent injuries. There's another one in review on um, delayed initiation of diphtheria, tetanus and uh, pertussis vaccine. And then there are two that, that are in progress. One is on the harmonization work and one is on um, GP registration for a linked survey and uh, routine cohort. This project ran for more than three years. Um, we were able to link two of the three data sets that we um, that we requested access to, and we're able to successfully link those to the routine health records that we had. Because we weren't able, because the numbers were very small, we're kind of seeing this more as a pilot feasibility study, because we don't have the statistical power that we would have liked. Um, when I published the article on this, one of the reviewers asked what sort of lessons I would, um, I would, or wisdom that I would pass on to other people looking to do similar work, I would say check your data access very carefully. Um, the English data, um, they publish the results of uh, the ethical reviews online. And if we had looked at this beforehand, we would have seen that there were quite a few applications to link survey data to the English data, and they were all refused. And if we had known that, if we had looked at that previously, we might have thought, well, yeah, OK, they're not at a point yet where they're linking uh, survey data to, um, to the routine data. You do need to be careful about consent, and consent can be a very difficult thing uh, to interpret. And as we found, it can be open to interpretation uh, depending on who you talk to. So Wales and Scotland both looked at the consent forms that were available and said, yes, these are fine. England, same consent forms, said, no, these aren't, um, these aren't appropriate. Um, that all ties in with the project timescales. Data access, data acquisition, dealing with the consent issues, getting ethics approval. This can take a long, long time, especially if you're the first, if you're early on um, doing innovative work with with linked data or with the data. It can take a long time to get access to and go through all the approval processes, and you need to factor this into your um, to your study plan. Um, measuring representativeness is a statistical challenge at the moment and is something that is going to be um, more important in the future as these sorts of studies um, become more prevalent. Um, it's something that we're looking at within ONS along with a general theme of work around applying survey methodology to tidy up um, some of the routine data uh, moving from academia to uh, to government, what I quickly discovered was it's not enough to say, oh yeah, we just had to exclude these these records because we didn't have enough data. You need to be able to report on the entire population and that might mean imputing missing values. Harmonization is a challenge. Um, at times, it's not as simple as you might think, um, but it is definitely worth doing. And I would recommend keeping that flexibility to harmonize data at, an, at a research level rather than providing a, a, a broader harmonized data set. It might be that um, this requires a bit more work and that you can do some initial work on harmonization, um, but allow a bit of flexibility or to offer advice um, to researchers depend so that they can make decisions based on what they uh, what their research needs are. But ultimately, this is a very worthwhile um, activity linking surveys to the 
to the routine health data. And I think this is something that is only going to become more and more important and more prevalent because you've got such depth of data from both different data sources um, that you don't have if you're if you're only looking at one. And so merging the two together, it opens up so many different research questions that you would either be incredibly time consuming and expensive to get on a survey or may not be accurate if you got on a survey and might not be possible if you're using if you're just using routine data. So I would definitely consider um, or recommend looking at um, linking surveys and admin data, but be aware that this is a bit more complicated than you might think. Um, yes, I think I have, still do have, oh, not too much time. Okay, any questions? The first question, yes, I'll just read it out for you and everyone else, and just a reminder for people on the uh, on the live webinar right now, please send in your other questions through the chat function as well. So comment is, thanks, Karen, for an insightful and interesting presentation. How did you come to establish your research-specific definitions? Also, do you have knowledge translation plans with health systems decision makers with respect to the findings of your research? Oh, the second one, I, I, I love the second one. Um, I'll answer the first one first. Um, so the research specific definitions, we it was a very big team. Um, there were four of us in Swansea and then there were another one, two, three, four, five, six or seven in UCL. So UCL provided the epidemiological work and Swansea was the, the methodological work. We worked very, very closely and at times we it, it sounds stupid, but I mean, Wales and London are sort of 200 miles apart. Um, so it's not just, oh, yeah, we sat down and, and had a chat. Um, we we did uh, make time to have um, site visits where the UCL team or members of the UCL research team came to talk to us. And in some instances, we sat them down in front of the data and said, right, this is what we've got. What do you need? And we went through what their research questions were and how that would translate to the data that we had. Um, so that was very much a sort of collaborative, communicative um, process. I hope that answers your question. Um, in terms of the knowledge transfer plans, I would love for there to be knowledge transfer plans with um, health systems decision making. Because I think that those of us who use the routine data are in an absolutely unique position to, to identify the, um, the common errors. And an example that I often give is the National Health Service in the UK know how many pregnancies occurred in the UK in a year. In sale, we know how many of those occurred in men. So there are there are errors that occur. GPs in the UK have seven minutes for each patient. There are going to be slips. There are going to be, I've picked, I'm in a rush. I'm tired. I've been working for 12 hours straight. I'm picking the first, the first option um, that sounds right. It's not, it's not to override the, those, those, um, the clinicians, uh, data selections, I, but I think that we should be in a position where we can create flags to say, are you aware you have just, um, uh, you have just requested a vasectomy for a two-year-old girl? Do you want to proceed? Yes, no. Might be that, yeah, this is absolutely accurate, but it might be that there was a slip. And that gives the, the clinician a chance to pause and go, actually, yeah, this isn't a two-year-old girl. This is a 56-year-old man. So at the moment, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any plans to work with decision the, the healthcare um, system decision makers, but I think there should be. That may not be the answer to your question. Um, if you're talking about decision makers in respect to uh, the policy, so how these research findings um, uh, 
impact on policy. I'm not aware of anything going on at the moment. I think this just goes through the usual academic uh, publication processes, but I might be wrong. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Um, uh, so, and just a confirmation, yes, thank you for answering my question. Um, okay, good. <laughs> clarification, always good to know. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, next question, um, uh, because this person missed the beginning of the webinar. Have, have you measured the agreement between administrative health data and self-declared data? Um, to an extent. Uh, one of the articles that we published, um, where is it, um, was on, where is it, it is asthma prevalence. So uh, this one, four down, Griffiths, Lyons, Bandiapati High, uh, Tingay, etc. Um, was looking at self or parent reported wheezing with general practitioner reported asthma diagnoses. Uh, that one was only in Wales, unfortunately, because we didn't have GP records from Scotland. But yeah, we there is scope to use both surveys and routine data to um, uh, to validate each other. Um, I'm doing this in my PhD at the moment. Uh, comparing my results against the 2011 UK census. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Karen. I'm just uh, waiting for any other confirmation uh, or for just in terms of answering your question or further questions. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it seems to me that the uh, that the harmonization of the data was was a big big challenge. How did you make some of those decisions around how you were going to, did you have a previous examples from other research or how, how did you go about making decisions about how we're going to harmonize the data? Um, to my knowledge, we didn't have previous examples. Um, Amrita's worked on other projects, so she might have, she might have had um, other examples that she could that she could have um, drawn on. Usually it was, again, sort of a collaborative process of these are the options, let's go through the pros and cons of the options and then decide based on the availability of the data, uh, the acceptableness, acceptability of the, the different options for the research, uh, that kind of thing. So it was, it was very much sort of an iterative type process. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you. sometimes I think we, we tried a few things out in order to um, find out which one was the mo which one would give us um, better results. And by better, I don't mean the highest p-value. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And and in terms of the experience you had with with England and and the difficulties of uh, not being able to get the data, do you do you think that? Um, I mean, I think you mentioned, well, we should have, you know, checked into the history of access and linkage privileges associated with, with, with data from England. But knowing what you know now and where you've gone, do you, do you think there would be an ability to go back to, to say, uh, this, th those who um, hold the, the, the data in England and say, we've done this research, these are our findings, would you consider, you know, for the future, you know, based on how far we've come now, you know, do you think you could go and re-ask? Would be would that be of interest to you, or would you do that? Um, that is something that we've talked about as a future um, as a future project. I think it's, to my knowledge, um, uh, linking English NHS data to external surveys isn't yet being done. They are linking to other data sources that they hold within the English NHS, um, but NHS Digital, I think it's called. Um, but they're not, to my knowledge, they're not yet linking to ex external data sources yet. But once they are, then yes, this would be something that um, uh, that we would be looking to do again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that's good to hear because certainly mm. I'm sure you feel you've invested some time. If, if you have the ability to, to to follow up, that would be probably something you'd want to do. Yeah, 
even if it's just to check the the results that we had. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, these were pilot studies by kind of necessity, but it would be good to validate that uh, the findings. Yes. Well, thank you. Any for, I don't see any further questions in the chat function, but I do know um, that we can certainly provide your email if people have yep, further fine. questions. So thanks again, uh, Karen, for, for, uh, for presenting today and sharing your experience and all the resources and information that you have. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us, and uh, I hope to connect with you in the future. It was my pleasure. Okay. Thanks, everyone, and bye for now. Bye.